All right, I hope this works. Uh, okay, so let's pop over to meeting minutes. So next week is our last week. Is that correct? Yes. Where the hell did my meeting window go? Okay. Let me share my screen with you guys. Okay, August 16th. Or is it technically this week? Through the 16th. Students submit final code and evaluations. Okay, through the 23rd. Okay. So, can we write code up till 23rd? Or, like, we have to... I mean, you can... Okay, so, I'm... I would like to see... Let's 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 go through and, and and see what what is left to do here on each project. Um, that's the first thing I want to do. I really want to get everything that was outlined in proposals completed. Um, if you want to keep writing code, obviously that's great. Um, but uh, as far as you know, GSOC is concerned, that we really oh, come on. Everything, nothing wants to work for me today. Okay. Uh -huh. As far as GSOC is related, uh, we need we need to try to get that stuff done by the 23rd. Um, come on, there we go. Okay, so uh, by done, do we mean merged? Yeah, in master. Yeah. Um, where's Tim? So let's go through and just get a status update from everybody. Um, okay, so Hashim, where are you at with your project? So what, what? Um, let's let's go through and 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 outline all of the things. So you just need multi-output, right? And transfer learning, or wait, not transfer learning. Um, uh, the other one was uh, tuning models, and uh, I think I'm pretty much uh, done with it. I also added uh, parameter grid uh, as part of the PR. Uh, I didn't PR it yet. Uh, my uh, remote is messed up. I'll yeah. do it as soon as uh, that gets fixed. Yeah, GitHub is all wonky right now. Okay, so, um, and then multi output. Right, so these yeah, are what I'll, we I'll have. I'll be needing reviews on these two. Okay. So, and then, so tuning models is, so multi output is, and so you need this, this is multi output is ready needs review. Is that correct? Um, or, yeah, ready for a review. Okay. Uh, there was uh, an error as well there. Uh, I didn't know much about. Okay. So let's get that. Um, Uh, so, is everyone having GitHub problems right now? Yes. <laughs> what is. kind of problem? This kind of problems. <laughs> they are, uh, they're having issues right now. A few seconds ago, it was just webhooks, but now it's everything. So, there's something's going on here, so we may run into issues. Uh, I thought I messed it up. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Um, all right. 
so we'll just leave that open. Um, all right, so you said there's an error. Uh, yeah, the HTTP error. Okay. okay. Uh, what the hell is this? Okay. Okay. Why would this be triggered? This thing should be like self contained. Um, Uh, uh, well, this is uh, due to the multi output changes, I believe. Uh, but I can't figure out how to. Yeah, this this little R proxy stuff really should have been self contained. So I'm wondering. Um, I'm wondering how it got messed up. Um, okay, so what is the test case that this is associated with? Okay, no, that's fine. Okay, um, And wait, this was, oh, this was your question about the models, so we're going to have to do something there. Okay, um, let's just make a note of that. Um, um, this is, okay, make pig numpy. Um, we needed to know how we're going to do this with, uh, how does this interact with immutable config properties okay. um, and then this guy okay Fake model context has no attribute config. Okay. Yeah, so this is sort of that risk that we want run um, with, um, this is sort of the risk that we run with that approach that we were talking about. You know, we talked about, do we move this thing? Um, um, do we make it so that the accuracy score, let's see, where was that? Um, so, if we go to context of 915. So, model context so this is from not CLI or oh, wait this is from tests test roots this fake model context Uh, 
util testing. Okay, so this is mad because fake model context has no attribute config. Okay. I think this is a, how did this not get caught before? Okay. It looks like this is an error with, um, let's see. So, multi output. Add predict features parameter to accuracy. Okay. Add support for multi output models. <clears throat> okay. So, all right. So, yeah, you did all those changes for ac the ac high level accuracy function in this? Yes. Okay, args. Okay, so we came in here. Hmm. Um, feature features. Okay. Um, all right. So you just grab grab all those features. Um, <laughs> that works. Yeah. Um, feature assignment. Main squared error accuracy. So, what happened to the MSC score here? So, in this case, score takes predict feature. Okay, so now it's only a single feature, though. So, didn't we want to possibly um, support multiple features? Uh, uh, yeah, we decided to uh, not support it in uh, the native ones, such as mean squared error and uh, CLF. Okay, but... So how would it be supported otherwise, though? Because if this only takes one, if our score function only takes one feature, um, you know, then then it's only going to take one feature across all of them, right? This is this is kind of why this kind of why yeah. I think it might make more sense to put this as a part of the config. Um, yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, score. Uh, but yeah. since... It would be nice to have um, it in, in the function. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think I think okay, so so we take the model context and we take the sources context. It seems like let's see.
this is, you know, it's not ideal, right? Um, I think you either need to take like a list of features here or let's see. Here's the features we're assessing the accuracy of. Um, yeah, I don't know. It uh, seems like you need to take a list of features here. Either either that or you need uh, to put Do it... we not? Yeah. Do we not only need uh, a list of features in case of multi-output? I mean, if you wanted to have a score that for some reason scored multiple features, right? I'm like, right, because we have to make this configurable. Um, this is why this is why it's nice if we could put it if we put it in the config, right? Because then whoever implements the score decides what what they want when it's configured, right? And the the calling parameters are not not so tied in. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it does it. So it makes sense on, on one hand, it makes sense to put it in the function or in the method signature, right? On the other hand, it, it sort of complicates things if, if we end up with multiple, um, you know, multiple features that a score might, might score based off of. Um, so, because we really have two options, we can either take, per, like, the way I see it, we can, we can, we can take this as like a variable, we can take it as an array, and then maybe most people take the first index, we can take it as a variable, you know, set of arguments, most people take the first index. Um, or, or, you know, just define their own feature here and then the rest trail off to nothing. So, um, uh, yeah, mm. I think you should just put it at the end because if you put it at the end here, for example, So you put it at the end, and this thing is called. Okay, so say say we have this approach, right? Um, so we put feature at the end, and then we have another class, right? Other accuracy context, and it wants two features. Right, maybe, or maybe it can take a variable amount of features. Right, then if this one gets called with more than one feature, it'll just throw an error right on call. If this one gets called with more than one feature, it'll just grab them all and use them. Right. Yeah. I think that might be the way to go if we're going to try to put this in the methods or in the method signature. Um, that would solve your problem. Now the question is like, oh. you know, yes. we use so we use the uh, so the question in my mind is 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 we use the uh, you know we use the config for a lot of things right, um, and it's like where 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 do you draw the line bet between something that goes in the config and something that goes in the um, you know in the method signature for these various classes. Um, and if we look, let's look at the model code because that could maybe help us guide our decision, right? Um, so if we look at the model code. Train and predict. So train takes sources and sources for predict. Everything else is contained within the config for the model. 
Um, <laughs> so, and and the reason why it's contained within the config for the model is because if you serialize the model to disk, then the model that's been trained is tied to those features. So the accuracy score is not serializable, but at the same time, yeah, so the accuracy score is once again, yeah, the feature, the feature really should reside in the method signature because it's not something that's ever going to be, you know, tied to the specific score, right? Say if that, if you were to serialize it to disk, does it make, does it, is it something that, that, that makes sense? Right. And I, I think, I think, okay, so I'm just trying to, I was just trying to, to suss out whether the, whether the features belong in the context or in the signature. And I think we're, I think it, you're correct that they do belong in the signature. So I think that your solution here is you, you should probably put them at the end and that way you could still support variable features. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Is there, the one thing that concerns me here is, okay, so let's see. The one thing that's, hmm, accuracy score context. The thing is with the accuracy score is like, it's all sort of, it's all sort of dynamic. So is there something at what, at what point, you know, okay. So, cause this is like, you know, I'm thinking about that double context entry pattern, right? And and so with the accuracy scores, you know, you configure the class and you, okay, you enter the context. I'm trying to figure out whether there's, whether there's a reason to use the double context entry pattern there. And I think the, the answer is probably... You know, the reason why we use it is because we don't know if there's a reason in the future. So we should probably just keep those configs. So we'll keep the accuracy score. Let's just move, let's just move features to the end of this because it's dependent on, it's highly dependent on, on the model context that's given. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. So features is dependent. The, the features here in the signature sort of go hand in hand with this stuff that's being passed also in the method. Therefore, all of this stuff is, you know, con this, this stuff is like the three arguments that we have are very closely related to each other, which means that they all belong in the method signature. Nothing belongs in the config for the accuracy context there. And if it did, then you know the, the 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 qualification on moving something from a config to a method signature is is it related to the other things for the method call, right? Um, and I think the answer is is uh, you know if we had sort of like you know for example uh, this is a, a dumb example but if we wanted to make this too configurable, right? Um, that would not be necessarily related to model context sources and feature. Um, it, it would be something that would go in the accuracy config. Um, I was just trying to make sure that we have that right there. Um, okay, so let's just move. Let's just move this, um, you know, to to the end, um, and then you can um, invalid number of features error. Okay, and then you don't have to add this logic because you know it'll it'll throw an error if you if the method call has more than one feature. Um, Okay, great. Um, uh, can you uh, describe the use case in which uh, mean squared error is getting more than one feature? I'm still not. This sure is so. That. This is not mean squared error. This is in general. If I if we're implementing an accuracy score, right? So this is other okay. accuracy context down here. This would be our our next implementation, right? This is a some other. Oh implementation of an accuracy oh, right. score, oh. right? Yeah, so then in that case, say this one accepts multiple features, then all we have to do is make the method signature star args, and then, you know, all the all the features will, will get will get passed here. 
um, you know, and then we could say, you know, if it's less than two, then we throw an yeah, error, that right? Makes sense. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I think that sort of um, fixes the uh, fixes the uh, okay. Um, yeah, that 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 sort of um, fixes the the method signature there. So let's. Um, Okay, let me do a diff on this. Okay, so... Okay, so... Let's make sure that this looks good. So features, feature, okay. Okay. Okay, and we gotta make sure that this is a relative import here. It doesn't get used. All right. So I think this is where we would want this patch to go. Um, um, and I'll just post this in a comment. Um, All right, so we decided that um, the MSC score, or we decided that the accuracy scores should um, take the, um, okay, should take the uh, features Uh, to score as their last argument to the score method. Um, in this way, uh, if a scorer wanted to implement or to work on multiple features Uh, the method signature would look simply be could be easily modified to be Um, so let's see. So then this was, this error was about, um, okay. Yeah, that's right. So this error was about config. Um, and I think this is actually, let's see, actx.score. Okay, so ACDX score, ACDX, CTX dot config dot predict. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, let's see. So I was like, okay, I was like, this is probably going to get complicated when we hit the HTTP service, and this makes sense. Um, so, because yeah, this is not now. It's it's no longer exactly straightforward to do the to do the. Uh, to do the uh, modifications to the HTTP service, unfortunately. So let's see. So, okay. Yeah, I think what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to do something similar to what you did to high level. Um, it's gonna be a little bit tricky though. Um, so service HTTP 
um, different service HTTP. Yeah, this is a. Yeah, this is a. This is a. Obviously, you know, you know, you had to change a lot of files. This is a not not an easy change. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this stuff gets so complicated so quickly. So, where is the score accuracy? So you're gonna need to, yeah, get source context. I think this is now your friend here. So, okay, yeah, source context to get label. Okay, now nah, yeah, this stuff needs to be. This is this stuff needs to be refactored at some point. Okay, so. What does our documentation say? Um, service HTTP docs. Okay. So. Um, Yeah, unfortunately, I think this stuff makes like no sense right now. Um, let's see. Yeah, because the way it had been originally written was to basically instantiate the sources and then post the sources as the body. Um, so you're posting the source context labels in the body, which is just kind of ludicrous. Um, we really should be able to post requests directly or records directly. Um, so, um, yeah, um, yeah, this is my insane decision. Um, okay, so, the thing is, and this is why it gets so complicated, sorry, um, let's see. Yeah, so when I had initially done this, and I think Sudhanshu, we talked about this needs to be refactored at some point. So I was also thinking it needs to be refactored so we could, mm, how do we deal with this right now? Um, yeah, I think I think for now, I think for now, let's definitely just make it to do out of this because this thing needs, where is that issue? Did we make an issue for refactoring this? Do you remember that, Sudhanshu? Oh uh, yes, I think we had an issue. Yeah, yeah. This this code, Hashim, this code is a mess. I apologize. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Where did it go? Refixes. Oh, I thought I had a patch for that. Um, okay. Where did that go? I thought there was a refactor task in here. Oh no. Uh, wait, why is this not marked as done? Let's talk. Um, okay, well, we don't have an issue for this, but so for now, for now, let's do exactly what you did. Let's, but let's just move it, you know, one over. So, because um, yeah, see, the thing is, this is what I was, this is what I was laughing about. Is this right here is going to be a pain to add features to um, I mean it's not that bad it's basically the same code you did it the changes you did in high level but it's just going to become this giant mess you know um, of like you know changes that are going to cascade through of, of things that we're going to need to refactor later so let's just sort of stop gap it just like you did um, and uh, MCTX uh, Let's do this stopgap measure like you did, and we'll just grab into the parent. I think that's the only change that is needed there. 
Um, let's see. Internal server. Base config object has now object. Okay, I think maybe we just need to modify the um, the fake model config here. So, um, util testing. I'm blind? I don't know. Let's see. Parent config. Base config object has no attribute predict. Oh, it's probably being instantiated with base config. Um, fake model base config. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so... Equals. Did we seriously? Okay. Yeah. I didn't do this. Okay. So yeah. So if we add this with a, um, you know, if we add this this with a with a feature to predict, uh, and then the question is, what the hell were we asking it to predict? Um, what is this test test score test score score? service okay so if we do this then this will be a good stop gap we'll refactor the HTTP service so you'll move you'll move um, the so you'll move the parameter to the you'll move the argument to the end um, and then propagate that change through and then you know propagate that change through your high level changes um, let me write this down Okay, so right, this is mainly because of need to refactor. Okay, so um, so let's move um, feature to score to end of score arguments, um, and then. Uh, the HTTP service here, um, and because we need to refactor, uh, would be too much work. Because then you have to update all the docs and all the other test cases and stuff. So we're just going to move this. Um, we're just going to do exactly what you did for now. Um, too much work. All right. Uh, to add features to request body right now. Um, we'll put this as a to-do for HTTP service refactor. Okay. Um, service HTTP, okay. Um, test, test routes. Sources add memory source 
and features is by 10. So let's just call this by 10. I'm not sure if this will do a trick for us or not, but let's find out. All right. Um, did I do it? Three fish. Score takes three positional arguments for we're given. Okay. Um, Nine seventeen. Oh, is this because we modified something? This is three positional arguments before we're given. Did we not? Maybe we need a different or add fake score. Add fake score is fake score. Fake score is score. Okay, so we needed to add features to this. Uh, feature. Okay. Um, okay, and this is the um, this is because this is not that order. Okay, great. Okay, so now this is all ordered um, correctly. Okay, so Hopefully, this is at least the changes you need to get the HTTP service working. Now, feature has no attribute with features. Oh, or the, yeah. Okay, there we go. So, Wait, where did the... Oh, oh, I was like, where did our changes to... Uh... Okay, so this is the changes to... So these changes are required to get um, scores working with HTTP service. Um, we need to add a to do to the HTTP service refactor to um, accept the um, features to score from the body the request body. All right, okay, I think we're good on that then. So does that give you, so you can go refactor that stuff and then I think we're ready to merge that, right? Have we updated all the tutorials and everything that's with that? Is there a tutorial on this? Yeah, yeah, we okay. got. Uh, you haven't uh, yet seen the multi-output uh, Oh, notebook. there's a multi-output right. notebook. Look at that. All right, great. Um, okay, so let me review that offline here because um, I think, you know, so let's let's go through and so reviewed in meeting. So we reviewed um, partially. Uh, and we need to move the score feature to the end of the argument. So once you've done that, then ping me for a review. 
um, and then I'll I'll tell you um, you know if like you know I mean you know how this goes right so um, let's see let, let's just yeah, make sure. sure that it's all as cleaned up as possible right if it all looks good then I'll just merge it um, but okay. you know I'm I'm assuming that you probably you made a logical tutorial so <laughs> um, yeah let's just try to make sure that we captured the other types of things you know if you use cache download uh, link to it that type of stuff that we had in the last ones um, uh, yeah. let's see. So, and then obviously, hopefully you've, you've mentioned, you know, here's where you can find the list of, or all the models support multi-output, right? Is, do you wrap? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then you mentioned that I assume, and, and, uh, you said anything in scikit. So great. Um, yeah, that should be fine then. Um, so parameter grid tuning model. So parameter grid is, is, is a non GSOC related, right? This is sort of just an extra spin off that happened. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was working on the tuning uh, models notebook, and uh, I thought we could, uh, you know, have uh, some sort of optimizer to uh, optimize the hyperparameters like uh, grid search uh, and etc. So uh, I didn't really implement grid search. Well, uh, grid search involves uh, a CV as well, so I just right. created a parameter for it to. Uh, search through the parameters and uh, look through their accuracies to see which one works better with the model. So we search... Uh, um, to search for the best hyperparameters. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, sorry, my laptop died. I forgot about that. <laughs> I was saying the same thing. <laughs> All right, yeah, I feel like they used to... I'm used to getting two warnings. I only got one. Uh, let's see. So working on tuning models notebook and implementing almost grid search. Um, so what what else? I wanted to capture some more notes on this. So you said, um, can you give me a little more details? Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, I'm uh, mutating uh, different hyperparameters uh, and uh, looking to see if. Uh, which ones uh, work best for our model. Uh, and the user is actually uh, providing a grid of hyperparameters to the function. OK, cool. And uh, yeah, it returns the, it sets the model to the best parameters and returns the highest accuracy. Very cool. Very cool. All right, great. Yeah, that's definitely a, 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 a that that'll be a big step for us towards uh, auto ML. So that's great. Um, so tuning models. What do we what do we want to talk about there? Um, uh, do you want to see the notebook? Uh, do I need to see the notebook? I mean, so I mean, I, I we can review it now. But is there anything that's that's blocked on it? You know. We can we can work through a blocked issue, but otherwise, you know, I I would assume it's probably you know probably pretty close to done, if not uh, done. So yeah, I made it work with uh, XG Boost models okay. uh, uh, because uh, they were actually uh, mutating the config inside the train uh, function. Uh -huh. uh, but when it go comes to scikit functions, they don't really do that inside train. They do it in 
uh, the a enter function and uh, uh, yeah. that results from uh, the oh, and, config and, not being and that's what we were talking about with okay so how how can we support um uh, mutable configs with scikit models right yeah okay so okay and so uh, the tutorial is working with the uh, xgb classifier currently okay great so xg okay great so that that's good then right we're good to go we just want to we want to uh, yeah just wanna... Okay, we need to make sure that we can we get we get those scikit models working though, yeah. Um, and that's essentially it. Looks like we have a, a, a open open questions around um, you know make config numpy, make config inspect, make config tensorflow, all those um, to to you know integrate those with the mutable config stuff a little more. Um, and we can talk about that in a future meeting, um, so we don't take up more time with that. But I think uh, you know what it'll come down to is um, um, uh, tail config. Okay, inspect is probably more friendly to look at. Um, what it'll come down to is okay. So we're looking at the parameters, right? So we can imagine this is kind of like the NumPy thing, and then you know we'll need to set field. We'll have field, and we'll need to set mutable equals true or mutable equals false, right? Um, so, um, so my config. Um, so, um, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, my brain just gave out. Um, um, yeah, we'll need to set mutable equals true or mutable equals false, right? And we talked about how we might want to, you know, set those for um, set those for uh, integer parameters or you know, etc. Um, and actually, that it kind of it kind of with the way that it works right now. With the way that the mutable config patch works right now, um, it creates a specific setter and getter method for each config property. But we could sort of make that runtime configurable so that after the config is created, that we could set specific properties to be, you know, enforcing immutability or not enforcing immutability at the property level. Uh, that could be a really good way to go there. Um, yeah, we might want to just do that because because either that 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 way you can sort of look at the parameters afterwards and have their values and all their typing information and everything and be uh, inspecting the data class object. Um, so, but open to suggestions, just an idea. Uh, So I'll just write that down as an idea, and then let's try to, um, you know, if anybody else has any ideas, shout out and get her or now, and we can figure that out. Um, there's definitely, you know, a bit of a performance hit there. But, all right, so we could make them rent, or we could make. Um, uh, can I share? Uh, uh, just just for the sake of a course snippet, can I share my yeah. screen? Yeah. Uh, just wanted to make sure if I'm on the right track. Let me know when you're sharing. All right, is it showing? Yes, okay, I can see. Uh, so basically, I don't know if uh, it was meant to be like this, but I uh, came up with this to mutate the... Uh, yeah, I mean, you can just do so model.config.learning rate equals 0 0.2, right? Or was there a reason you used set at her? Uh, yeah, it won't do that. It won't do that. Yeah. Hmm. Why? So what? Why? Why won't it do that? What happens? Because that's a problem. Uh, I, uh, I, I might be mixing up the issues with scikit models here. Uh, but 
uh, I think uh, it was a generic issue. All right, yeah, let's just give it a try and see what happens. So we can just try one of them. You can just try just the landing rate or something. Make sure you lowercase that R. Right. I think it's lowercase. All right, let's see what happens. Um, uh, the issue was that uh, I think it didn't change it in the config. Um, I don't understand. Is it working? Or I'm I'm confused at what's happening. I'm not sure what I'm looking at really. It's whether it's running or it looks like it didn't finish running, right? Or is has it uh, yeah, it's running. The ones below. Okay. Oh, the ones below. So why didn't we get any output from this? Uh, we got an output of the uh, same accuracy as the one above. Uh, oh, okay. And I rerun this one after that. Oh, okay. Let's see. Uh, so basically setting the learning rate to 0 0.2 didn't change the accuracy at all. Okay. Uh, Okay. Oh, there we now we got output. Okay, so so it did. So it does work. It doesn't blow up, right? Yeah, it does work. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. So that was localized. So we may have a problem with Scikit. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me make a note of that. I guess uh, it could be the same problem because uh, it doesn't really change it. Uh, it doesn't really change the config stuff. So it could be the same problem that uh, resulted in me going for this route. Yeah, OK. All right, I'll, uh, I'll change it to okay. Sweet. Uh, the other way. Okay. All right, so let's see. So where are we at? So this is all your uh, GSOC related stuff, right, Hashim? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, great. So let's capture everybody else's. Um, thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, Sahil, so how, where are we at with your stuff? So I, I made all the changes that you requested and okay. also prefactored the archive part. So I Great. just need to go on that and then I'll do the housekeeping stuff of making every model run with it. Great. Great. Okay. So let's see. Okay. Great. We'll have this DF archive. Get archive. So I tried to condense this as much as I could. Mm -hmm and break it into smaller parts, but it's still very verbose. Aha, I like this. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, okay. Great, great. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, get operations. So actually, instead of passing the action from the uh, 
model class, we are just deducing it because uh, action can be reduced pretty simply. If input is a date directory and an output is a file, then it is a compression uh, action, archive, I mean, archive action and extraction otherwise. Okay. So. so what you're looking at here is actually three cases. Uh -huh. Uh, actually, what happens is it was uh, like the file. Uh, uh, <coughs> it, it's like the file can exist and it cannot exist. And the other thing that can change is that other variable is the path can be a file or a directory. Mm -hmm. And the, the third variable is uh, uh, it could be in input or output. So taking the cross product of all these three possibilities, we end up with uh, two into two into two, that is uh, eight possibilities out of which uh, three are invalid and uh, other five possibilities can be grouped into three cases, which are being shown, which have been shown here. Great. So uh, like cool. I, all the math it's it's yeah it yeah true tables yeah okay cool create chain to archive data flow so i have spotted that those uh, data flows where we were adding a compression operation after uh, archive operation or an archive operation after, com after a compression operation decompression operation uh, were actually very much same, just with some minor changes. So I made it as like chained operation where I can switch the order of the operations and it will work uh, in an operation agnostic manner. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, the one thing I would say, so we have this temperature that should probably be something that needs to be set at runtime. Yes, that's being set in the main function, which is being called in model. Uh, so that is being passed down here. Okay. I mean, at runtime of the data flow, though. So let's see. Seed input path. Okay, so yeah, let's check that out. Okay. Um, Create archive data flow, create chained archive data flow. Okay, great, great. Um, so, let's see here. Location saves, location. Okay. Yes, so that, that part about loading stuff. So, uh, actually, it is if it is already in memory, I don't need to mutate it. Uh, but when I need to add new properties to the config, how will I do that? Uh, what? Like to uh, here, the arbitrary model config? Yes, for example, there is a config and I only pass few of the fields and I don't pass rest of those. And then I load it from a file. Uh, so it has a config file and it has the missing properties. But uh, like you, you uh, uh, how will I add those properties in the existing config in memory? Um, hmm. Okay. Can fix Okay. So let's see. So actually, if you take a look at the flowchart below, it would be like much clearer what okay, is happening. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so, okay, yeah, this isn't necessarily what I'm confused on now. Okay, um, so this is a great flowchart. This is great. Um, so um, I'm thinking more about that config.json right now. Um, I'm trying to figure out what's happening there. Um, I didn't get a chance to respond to this, unfortunately, but uh, it looks I'm glad you went through with your... Uh, with your changes, because that was the right, right, right course of action. Um, so let's see. What is this config.json? It is the file of uh, that is exported from our config model config at exit and saved. Oh, that is config.json. Oh, that's config.json. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Great. Um, okay, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, so config, um, load flow. Okay. Location load. Okay. So what happens if we don't have a load flow then? So actually in run operation, if it is passed as none, so we then just you, create great. our own data. Fantastic. Okay. So seed. Okay, input path, output path, great, okay. Now, let's see, so get definition. Uh, so, get definition is defined as a function, otherwise it's defined as What is good definition? Okay, good definition. So actually, it was being duplicated two times the same if condition, like if it is a model, uh, the, the the property as value would define the definition. So if it's a DIR, the directories, the temporary directory, then it would be the model temdr definition. Ah, Otherwise, great. it would be the model location. Great, so. great, great. Okay, and those definitions are... On the here. top. Great, perfect. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, run the data flow. Get directory. Okay. And then... So, this is... Where are we here? Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, this looks great. Looks great. Good job. Very good job. So I just like, uh, and ideally it should not break anything because we have not added any archive tests yet in any of the models, but mm -hmm. all of the models are giving a similar similar error with the same error message, which has a very same trace, similar trace path. So if you can check the second last, if the latest one hasn't completed yet, uh, they have all like uh, something wrong with the high level stuff being called. Let's pick TensorFlow. And then type object is not available. Ah, I yes, think we just means... forgot to return a enter. Um, this is a common thing. So if we just jump into this, hello, come on. I think all that's missing here is, yeah, all we need to do is just uh, um, return self. I think I think that's it. Just the return self is missing because um, a enter needs to uh, it a oh, enter yeah. essentially. Yes. It most yes. mostly most of the time you return self. Yeah. Um, so let's see. That's probably going to fix that. Um, okay. Okay. Nice. Okay. And so we add. Great. So the only question remains that how should what should be done with the config loading stuff because 
yeah, what should be done with the config loading stuff. So I try to do it in an isolated way, like creating a config class test and like try to add a new field to it. But it it just didn't take that new field. Like if there are two parameters only already, so I cannot add a third parameter in it, which is not already there. Yeah. Uh, wait, what? You can't, what do you mean? Wait, can you say that again? So like, for example, if I have a class with two parameters, A and B, and I want to load a third parameter from the config, which is not there already in the config, like it is not instantiated already to some value, so I cannot add it. So if the class, the config class changes, is that what we're saying? Like the, the Python class is not, doesn't, the properties of the Python class don't match the properties of the, that exist within the config.json. Is that what you're talking about? No, no. Uh, what I'm trying to say is like, uh, if we have a configuration file, which has some values, which is not already been instantiated in the current model. So how do I add that to the config in the memory? Can you show me an example of what you're what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So I will go through. Mm, can you see my screen? Yes. So this is uh, a valid test case for our uh, a valid case for our con model config where we have two properties. So if I load something and it has a property C, say it is like uh, something like something like that, I want to add it to config dot C dot uh, C is equal to C. So won't show anything. Sorry. So it is not being added. Like I know I want to add a third property, but it is not being added. So why do you want to do that though? Uh, so if it is none. So should I add it? Like, what should be done? I'm a bit confused about. Oh, oh, okay. I see why you're confused. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> why, why you would be confused here? Okay. So, um, so, uh, can you? Sh uh, let's see. So let's bring. Let me show that code again. So, um, okay. So you're saying. So so. Your, your screen is not visible currently. Yeah, it kicked me out. Okay. There we go. Um, so you're saying um, if we want to add... So why why would we want to add a property, uh, I guess? You know, so, so the reason why... Okay, uh, let me say the reason why we're doing that get at her with the default of none is just in case the because this is the model base class right so we're implementing some some helpers and stuff in, in the base class if the you know the the subclass defines these properties like so if the subclass defines the location property then we're going to um, then we're going to do this stuff right but we don't we don't necessarily um, uh, 
it's not a given that the subclass will define the location property, right? Um, so that's why we're checking with get after. So so why would we want to set um, a property? Is this this have to do with the config.json loading? Is that what your concern is revolving around? So here? or yes, so it, it, some some attributes, some config properties are needed and. Is it like all config properties are needed while loading, while instantiating a model? Uh, all config properties are needed while loading. Oh, wait, I don't understand it uh, still. So while instantiating a model, like if I'm creating a model mm -hmm. uh, in the memory, do I need to pass all the config parameters? I mean, yeah, unless they have default values, you would need to pass, you know, their values. So right? if it is already there and the person is trying to load from a config, so and we don't yeah. want to overwrite ah, the value, see. then I then see. then what what do we do? So that yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, let's see. So in that case, in that case, we'd need to load from the location, right? And then, and then we'd instantiate the model after we've loaded it from its location, right? Okay. Because we would we would take a location, we'd load the location into memory, then we'd load the config JSON, and then. Once we had the config JSON, then we could instantiate the model, right? But the model calls this part, right? So well, that's what I'm saying. We're going to have to change that, right? So, so let's see. So, and I think this is sort of going off that create discussion that we'd had. You know, the creating a specific model, um, um, you know, modifying our our helpers there, right? So, because we talked about that, like model.create or something like that, or the entry point.create, where you yes, pass. Yes, sure. Yeah, so, so exactly, yeah. So this is sort of like an extension of that, right? Where you'd be doing, um, and I think we even talked about maybe the name, the need to, didn't we? I think we talked about perhaps the need to rename the load or to repurpose the load function or load class method. Um, because I think what we end up with here is really like, um, you know, we need we need to be able to take a data flow um, and load from the data flow and then instantiate the class using the config parameters. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so what we would do is we'd modify that. I can't remember when this discussion happened. Um, so, but... so the whole code of like loading the model should be outside the model, ideally, because before yeah. instantiating the model. It should yeah, be yeah. And so... I think this is going to be generic code. I mean, this isn't even going to be tied to models at this point, right? It's really just going to be like, you know, this is how you load any of these da base data flow facilitator objects, right? Um, because we we have uh, yeah like this would work for anything that has a config right you know you can take a data flow load the content you know you basically take the output of the data flow and the output of the data flow should be um, okay this yeah this is interesting so the output of the data flow would be some instantiation of a model which has this config Yes, exactly. Well, no, actually, I think I think so. Let's let's drill it down a little bit further. So, um, so okay, let's see. Let me write some code here. So, if we can like make a issue side by side on this, so yeah, we let's do it. Like good, great, uh, great guiding documentation side. Sort of. Great. So let's see. Let's let's maybe pop open an an ADR here. Um, so check out. Let's check. Uh, okay. All right. So yeah, this is good stuff. So, um, let's see. So CP. Okay. Um, this is. Object to and uh, 
Okay, so object saving and loading with data flows. Great. All right, so. Uh, about the load, uh, load uh, function. Yeah. Uh, I think there is an issue uh, for the create method. Uh, issue is level 56. What? Uh, the issue number is 1156. Uh, 1156. For model create. Oh, okay, great. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, 1156. So, uh, all right, so this brought up discussion about, so, but this luckily, so I think we're good. Okay. So what do we need to do? All right. So yeah, let's just finish taking these nuts here. So, um, So, this is a follow on to saving and loading, model saving and loading. Um, uh, we uh, need to define, need to this document um, outlines. Our plan to implement a generic uh, saving and loading mechanism uh, for all um, uh, base configurable objects. All right. Um, So, uh, and where was the base configurable meta class? Base configurable. So, base configurable is basically anything that takes a config, right? Um, and, okay. So, yeah, so basically, we can use the stuff that you implemented here to save and load anything, right? Um, let's see, see the, so you, you, all of a sudden your, your project is applicable to more than just models. Um, so, so, da, 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 da. Right, we don't need this. Okay. Um, so where's your code here? And let's use that as our guide. So essentially what's our flow? Our flow is um uh, we've got um you know start with uh or well okay so we're gonna do we have we let's let's just think about um how do we think about this well we know we have two async functions right we know we have we know we'll have two, or well, let's see. One one of them is really the important one, right? So we have a we have a um, so we have a save and load of any object uh, will. Save and load of any object. So save takes the object um, and and a data flow or a location. Um, so if a location is given, uh, we do the uh, we run the code. Uh, use um, we run the code to create a data flow um, to save to the or which will which saves 
to the given location. All right. Okay. So save takes the object and data flow or location, and that's essentially what you have here in the a enter method, right? So this is, or no, in the in the a exit method, right? Because you'll basically be taking, you'll basically be taking the the config, um, and you'll be, you know, serializing out the config. The data flow will be, or you'll serialize out the config. The data, well, okay, so the data flow would be responsible for taking a config. It would take a exported config. Okay. So, data flow is given the uh, plugin type uh, plugin um, um, okay actually this might have to do with the unified config stuff so the data flow would be given the so this is a tricky thing so we've talked about this many times before because you need to give people control somewhat, but you can't, so you can't give this information on disk too much control. Um, because if you give it too much control, then all of a sudden you open yourself up to, you know, unintentional side effects. Um, and unintentional side effects is basically like, you know, um, uh, uh, for example, the uh, YAML safe load. And if you've seen the, the vulnerability around that, so YAML safe load CV. So basically, um, you know, the argument here is, uh, where is this stuff? Okay, so Okay, so basically, essentially, the YAML spec says that you can sort of, it's very similar to the what we've got here, where it says you can sort of take a, a Python path, right, like a, you know, module dot submodule dot submodule, you know, colon class type of thing, or I think it just uses dots, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and you can, uh, and then you can instantiate that uh, class or and you can even call like you know the thing was they could call os.system right and run commands right so uh we need to avoid that type of situation um and the the way that we can avoid that type of situation is is you know putting some filtering on what we load um and so in this case right so say we're say we're loading or say we're saving an object right um, we know we know the type, right? So the type in this case is is a model, right? So we know that when we load back in the model, like we know that we're loading using um, the model, like you know we we know we're so think about this from the standpoint of a config, right? So if I have a config um, and it has you know the properties and then the data types, right? So if I were to load, you know, if I were to load features and I were to load it from a location, um, then I, uh, if I were to load features from a location, um, I, I know that it's of type, so features isn't a great, uh, well, so if I were to load features from a, from a location, then I know that the data type is features, right? So I know I'm going to load a features object. So say it was a, one of our plugins, right? Or better yet, you know, say, say, let's see. Say we had a config, where is, let me just pop this one open. Um, so we look at like, for example, one of these, uh, 
one of these uh, operations. So the, the model, yeah, model predict, right? So say we have we have this model predict config, right? And it takes uh, you know a type of model, right? So we know that we know that we're loading a model. Um, so then we just need to know which model we're loading, right? So if we if we open it up and we say, okay, you can load anything, then all of a sudden we we open ourselves to that libyaml style uh, CVE, right? And we don't want to do that. Um, so we need to we we need to have some restriction on it. Um, so we we know we're loading a model, right? And so we need to we need to somehow type give... check. Hmm? Type check. Type check what we're loading. Yeah, yeah. So 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 the data flow is given the plugin type. Let's see. So when we're saving, we save data flow the plugin type, uh, which plugin. So this would be, you know, model, and this would be which plugin would be, you know, maybe like Scikit. LR, um, and then the config. Okay. So let's see. So save takes an object data flow is given. So the data we give the data flow that's responsible for saving. Pass as inputs to the data flow. The plugin type. Um, which plugin and the config, right? So now we should have all the information we need, right? Is there anything else that we need? Okay. All right. Um, so let's see. Where? What else do you have in your code here? So, is this? Does this sound good to you so far? Uh, yes, but uh, what should I ideally do here? Because uh, the loading and saving in a generic method, in a generic method, would be like. A, a, a task on its own, and we would be deviating from the proposal a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so I think. So I if, think if, you're basically just going to put this in another function, though. Is 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 really the deal, right? So this, all you're doing is is this a exit method is just going to call a function where you you've made the body this, right? And you're passing self config location, right? So this stuff here. Let's see, 1174. So, JHPR checkout. If you abstract this at one level higher, then all of a sudden we we uh, we can just call this function somewhere else, right? I guess we could abstract it later. Um, I guess we could do this later. So for you. Well, Actually, I'm like short of short of time at this point. Like, uh, yeah, I yeah, have exactly. a lot of housekeeping stuff to do with other models. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so let's just file this as something to do later. Good, good point. Um, because this should be relatively simple, though. So it's just good to know, right? Um, yes, it could be like moving things and making them generic, but it would include extra time of testing. And yeah, that. exactly. And yeah, so let's let's put this. What should go where? Yeah. Yeah, let's put this after GSOC, but it, it's good to know that I think we're almost there. So, um, so, and then the main thing was, you know, what happens with the load. So I think this is also going to sort of fix the load problem. So right now, because that was how this discussion started. So you come in and you need to know. For now, I'll keep uh, from loading, so I will not load anything. Uh, so uh, it will be sort of a to-do thing because Let's we cannot see. load anything right now. Well, you can load, if you instantiate a model with parameters, you can load the model, right? And that would load it, you know, and give it the correct 
tempter and everything, right? With the loaded model contents, it just wouldn't load the config properly right now, right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so let's see. And then if from, from that perspective, um, yeah, I think let's just do, let's maybe do, um, so let's have, let's leave this as a to do for now. Um, but within this loop body, um, instead of, um, instead of pass, uh, let's do a comparison and, uh, log self.logger dot, um, warning, uh, that the config differed. Um, or let's do, um, instead of pass, let's set, set anything that is of the correct type. Um, so for example, so stir or, uh, so if is instance of, so Basically, if the thing that you loaded here, so if loaded config, so if the value from loaded config is the same type as what it is, it should be in the um, config class, then override. Um, no, Other... we, we don't override, right? Because it's just uh, that is what oh, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is what the ADR says. Yeah. So, um, okay. So then it would. Okay. So yeah, the whole but... thing. Okay. Yeah, the whole thing is essentially a to do then. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we can log the differences, like if it is not consistent yeah. for the loaded one. So that's the best we can do for yeah. now. Okay, great, good, okay, perfect. Okay, so let's do that. Um, and then, so do you need, is there anything else that's blocking you here at this point? I think you're good to go, right? No, but uh, like, it, it's pretty much that it, like I have everything okay. figured out right now. So let's see, so we have a to-do on config loading, uh, which we um, need to figure out how to, um, or how we want to load an object uh, from a data flow, um, then uh, read in its config, uh, load the Python uh, entry point associated, and then pass the uh, config on uh, loaded from the data flow to the uh, loaded or config loaded from the data flow to instantiate the uh, entry point. Okay, too many too many usages of the word loaded there. Um, overloaded. Um, okay, so you are good for next steps then? Is there yes. anything else you need here? Or you... No, no. Great. Um, all right, great, great. Okay, great, great work. Looking good. So, let's see. So, Sudhanshu, where are you at here? Uh, so, I have been, like, working on uh, creating an example. Okay. For the cleanup operations. Okay. Yeah, so I haven't pushed the changes yet. I like, uh, I'm facing some issues with the output layer. Okay. So I would like to share my screen. That sounds good.
So is right. my screen visible? Yeah, we can see. Uh, so uh, right now, uh, what I have done up until now is uh, I have created the input layer, which will take all the inputs uh, and it will create it into a matrix and then it will perform the uh, operations, cleanup operations. So this was one of the uh, operation which I performed on a data set and it gave give out like a normalized uh, data set which you can use for training and testing. Okay. Uh, so the my, my problem here is that uh, uh, when this in so uh, how it actually works is that input layer creates a matrix and then on top of that matrix we can perform like several cleanup operations. Uh, and after that, uh, I have this output layer. So in the output layer, what I'm trying to achieve is is to get, uh, like, like this is in the form of a matrix, right? This thing. So I was actually uh, trying to get, like, a single row uh, of this matrix and, uh, and return it so that it can, again, be converted into a form of records. Hmm. All right. So you want to grab each row and put it back into a record? Yeah. So I, what I was actually doing here is like uh, I created a class, output layer class. And in that I have this index value. So it will uh, give me like which row we want to output. And uh, for the context, I have written this code. But the, uh, the problem in this part here is like uh, suppose we have 19 features and uh, uh, let's say we have uh, 20 uh, data points we have 20 rows in the in the CSV file then this code actually runs uh, uh, both the uh, multiplied by that times yeah um... that's actually the problem because I'm not able to uh, do it like that yeah okay so all right. Hmm. So your approach right now is you had those scikit operations, and they take. So do those operations that you'd implemented before this, the ones that wrap the scikit stuff, do they um, do they take the entire data set as a list and then do cleanup on that? Yes. Yes, that's how it. Like, that's how I've written most of the operations. Okay, so... Okay, so, but some of them require that and some of them don't, right? Like, w remove white space could be done on a single piece of data. Yes. So some of them require the entire data set. So which ones require the entire data set? So, so, so suppose this standard scalar method Mm -hmm. which actually removes the mean and uh, it uh, it like normalizes it so that it can have a unit variance so this one will actually require the whole data set so that it can actually look at the data set and then perform its computation and okay. also we have like uh, uh, decomposition uh, uh, operations which requires the whole data set Okay. So, all right, I'm gonna pull this out here. So, let's see. Um, I don't. I don't think we should be doing this input layer, output layer stuff. I think we should really make this at the scope of whatever operation requires the entire data set, you know? Um, so, okay. So it requires, okay, so if an operation requires the entire data set, then what did we do for this previously? Didn't we, haven't we done this before? Um, let's see. Where did we do this before? Um, uh, where was it? It was in the, the SciPy stuff, right? Operations. Um, NLP. 
Very spacey stuff. Okay, so what did we do? Um, where did we do this? Uh, actually, I think we did it uh, in the NLP yeah. exam stuff. So they but have a was, yeah. So we have that collect output, right? So so how does this differ from that? Let's see. In the collect output, uh, actually, uh, in the NLP example, what we have is we have sentences and the output. Mm -hmm. So we we just take all the sentences and then we create a matrix out of it. And for the output, how it is done is, uh, we take each of the uh, input string and we find what is its index in the in the in the collected output, mm -hmm. and then whatever is the corresponding uh, like a value, uh, the list value, we actually return that. Okay. And is that that? Okay, let me open that up. I need to see it. Um, that must be under tutorials, tutorials. Um, wait, where is this? Where is the... P operations. Where do we have that? What? Where's the tutorial for that? Uh, the tutorial name is using NLP operations. It's under data flows. Oh, under data flows. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. So. So, yeah, this here is, so, so this actually extract array from matrix actually works like output here, mm -hmm. like an output. So here we have like a single text example, and then we have the collected text. Mm -hmm. So what we try to find here is what is the index of this uh, text in the collected text. So we try to find out what is the index and in the input matrix we actually return that row mm -hmm. and all the columns of the And all the what? And all the columns of that row. So if mm -hmm. this is actually in the form of a matrix value. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Move stuff. Okay. Okay. Where did that go? I'm going through it right now. Okay, so collect output. Okay. Okay, so remove stop words. Okay, collect output. Collect the text. Okay. Um, and extract a rate from the matrix. Collect output all. TFT directorizer result. Hmm. Okay, and then didn't we have a specific, did we have a, yeah, we had a way of running the data flow that, yeah, there, there was some way that we run the data flow that, that runs them all at the same time or something, or where, Where is that? Didn't we? Okay. I thought there was some way that that different uh, source DF did or DF. So what was it called? All for single. Run all records through data flow, flow before grabbing results of desired record on a call to record. <clears throat> 
yeah, where is that all for single opening use? That's not getting used. Why? Okay. So this collect output, what the hell is happening here? So I thought we'd implemented that all for single specifically for this. Um, because you need to run everything through, let's see. All self-parent list collect. I'm looking at collect output context. So self-parent length. So yeah. So our options here. Okay. So the reason why we had that all for single was we had to submit. What was that? That was submit. Oh, what is this? Okay, so all for single. Run something. Oh, no, that's if you're only running a single one through. Okay, so in this one, the other way. Okay, yeah, so all for single is if you're running a single record through and you request that. records otherwise if you're running them all then you're gonna get all okay hmm so right now you're facing the issue of indexing into the output layer right yes okay Previously, we could just index in easily because we just needed to. We could use. Sorry, we could use this string, um, right? And now we can't just pull from the string. We need to know a specific index that it entered at, right? Yep. Okay. Um, I mean, I think you could return. Can't you return something from? Uh, your input layer operation that is the index it was input at or something? Right, like... So, we will have to do it uh, like the, the data present in the input layer will actually be processed through many other operations. So it may happen that we may lose the indexing also. Okay. Wait, but you're talking, we're talking for a single record. You put it into this giant array, right? And then you run the... Okay. So you take all your records in the data flow and you put yes. them in a list. Yes. And then you run them through your scikit operation that, that okay. you know, yeah. Um, and then you need to figure out which index in that output list maps to which record. Um, uh, not necessarily. We need to know, like, what we need. Really need to do is like, uh, give the out. Like, we have this matrix, uh, pre-process matrix, and we have to just return each of the row. Uh, so that uh, it will come in the CSV format when we do the merge command. Or even if we not do the merge command, but if we try to train on something, then at least we have the uh, column name so that we can uh, do training on top of them. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, like, whether it's more trouble than it's worth to implement these around Scikit, because our whole approach requires streaming 
I mean, yeah, okay, we're already here. Um, okay, so... So can you show me what you're, where you're at right now? Can, can you show us what's going on? Okay, so uh, let me start with the... Uh, so this is the data flow create command which I have created. So the so uh, where is the data set? So I have a data set with me. Uh, it is very small, uh, but like it is a very large data set. But I actually kept it small so that mm -hmm. we can run through it multiple times. So this is the data set we have, and it is a CSV format. Okay. Uh, yes. So now here, what we are doing here is in the flow. So we have three things. So this is the output layer result. We want to get it into single spec. This is the source length, which is actually how many uh, rows we have in the CSV file. Mm -hmm. And this is the feature length, like in each of the row, how, what are the number of features that we have? Mm -hmm. Right. So in the seed, what I'm doing here is I'm providing all these values uh, to the input layer, uh, input data points. Okay. Input layer also has another input which is source length and feature length. So it will uh, take all these values and it will convert into a matrix form. So after that, the input layer will return a data which is this output, which will then go to one of the uh, standard scalar operations, which will uh, remove the mean and it will uh, uh, transform it in such a way that it's uh, it has a unit variance. So this is the operation which we are performing on top of this matrix. Okay. And when we are done with the perf uh, performing the matrix, so what I'm doing here is whatever the result we are getting out of this operation, we will give it to the input layer, uh, which has inputs data. Mm -hmm. And this uh, the output layer, so this is an output layer which has input data. So this output layer has an output result which will give it to like single spec. Mm -hmm. So this was the uh, data flow uh, creation operation. And then we have the merge command. So in the merge command, what I'm doing is I'm running the, uh, whatever the data flow we got in the JSON format, mm -hmm. I'm trying to run it through the data set that we have and uh, create another uh, data set, which is the pprocess data set, which we have. Okay, so I think, I think that the way that the that the data flow source works right now, which is essentially iterate over all of the records, may not be the best way to do this, right? I think that we may... Okay, so... Um, we're having to do a lot of extra stuff here, right, to get this whole data set flat. Like to load in the whole data set, right, and then run it through these operations that take the whole data set, right? Yeah. So, and, and that's essentially because, you know, the way that we're currently running it is to, you know, pass each record to a data flow one by one. Now, if we, if we had another way of, 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 of doing, you know, if we had a source, for example, that, um, output um you know output records uh not necessarily based on you know not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping of input so so if we had a if we had a source that when you ran it every time um the uh the results were yielded from the output like if we had a source that within within so basically it runs a data flow and within the data flow we load all the data from a source from a, from a subsource right yeah. so we want to load data from that csv file right that kc house data right yes. so yeah. say we had a data flow that ran some operation that load every single record from the kc house data set csv file right um, and now it takes all of the records and it passes them, you know, as a, now, now you have, you know, an operation that loaded all of your stuff. So now it is flat, right? Yeah. So yeah. now you can go and you can pass that 
you know, to other operations within this data flow. Yeah. And then you just need a way to yield one record, you know, for each row, right? Um, it's because in this in this new setup, right, we don't necessarily have, you know, we don't necessarily know that we're doing, you know, a set of operations on each row. We just know that we're running a data flow and it's going to yield us a bunch of records, right? Yes. So this is almost like a streaming use case here, right? This is like a run a data flow and it will return a variable amount of records, right? And it just yeah. happens to be that we know how many records it's going to return um, because it's uh, it's doing that it's it's doing that from a from a from a CSV file that we know of. But but in general, you know, it, it doesn't. We this is essentially our first. This would be our first like streaming source, right? Um, so the question is, how do we? I mean, would that? I mean, that that should make things a lot easier for you, wouldn't it? Yes. Okay. So then we would need to figure out, you know, what does that source look like, right? And and how do we how do we grab the records out of it, right? Do you return some giant object and then each you know, do does it return, you know, in the in the results dictionary, right, for one context? Does it return you know, uh, uh, something that you convert into records and you yield each one. Um, that could be probably the easiest way to go about this for now, right? Yeah. Um, I think that might be, you see You see what I'm saying though, right? Yes, yes. I think that might be a really easy path forward to, for you. Um, and, and because, you know, part of what you're doing here is, is, is you're implementing cleanup operations, but you're also trying to discover what is the best way to, to implement cleanup operations, right? Um, yeah. And I think what we've seen so far is that, you know, we we know that there are operations that take the whole data set, right? And so the, the existing approach that we have a process, you know, the existing, the, the only reason it is the way it is right now is just because that's the way we implemented that first data flow source, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, right? We can have multiple data flow sources or sources based on data flows, right? Because the current one, it may just need to be renamed, right? To, you know, run data flow on, you know, one run data flow on each record type of, or something like that, right? Um, and this one is just, you know, run the data flow and the output is each record. So I would say, I would say that's probably, does that, do you feel like that would give you a clearer path forward here? Yeah, so I will have to like implement a source for it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I would say you could implement a source. Um, let's take a look at what the data flow source looks like right now. Um, let's see, what do we have here? Input set. Um, so this. Okay. Yeah, this stuff all needs to get. This stuff will all get consolidated. Um, so I think, and this just to hit on this again because I don't think we quite quite did it, but you know how we're um, like with the location stuff. We now have another place. So we have the data flow source. We have the data flow running stuff, and then we have the run data flow operation and we have the model saving and loading, all of these are places where, you know, we're, we're taking a data flow and, and we're executing it. Um, I think that what we'll probably get to is we're gonna go through and consolidate all of those places to actually call through the run data flow operation eventually. Um, and that way, anytime you run a data flow, um, you're, you know, you're leveraging the same code, right? Because what's going to end up happening pretty quickly here is, um, you know, we already have seen it in the data flow source and the existing data flow source and in the existing command line interface code. Um, and I think in the HTTP service code is that we have to, 
it's like, oh, okay, you're running a data flow. You know, you need to make sure that you provide um, inputs to each context or, you know, which context do you want to run, right? And so all of that stuff probably should sit behind the run data flow operation eventually. And then, like we talked about with this, you know, you know, everything is sort of a, a plug-in, right? And this will have to do with the unified config is once we can get the config a little more unified to where operations um, you know, individual functions and operations and stuff like that look more like um, the rest of our classes, then any time we want to, you know, we have something that needs to, to take a data flow, um, it will take a configured uh, run data flow instance, right? Because that configured run data flow instance would also have information like what orchestrator to run the data flow in. Um, and, and we should, you know, that way we should reduce the duplication of code. But for now, um, where I'm going with this is you'll probably, you know, want to use the existing data flow source as a guide. Um, and you'll probably end up copy pasting a lot of code. Um, but I think that I, I, you may you may end up with less stuff, but because essentially what you really need to do is you don't have to worry about the source as as a. Uh, as an input, right? You might have to, you'll have to write a new operation that, you know, you'll have to write a new operation that, that outputs all the records from a source, right? You know, that would be something that you would do here. Um, and in your configuration of the data flow, then you would point it at that CSV source, right? Okay, so uh, we are going to use the data flow source, right? Mm, and I, I think I you need to write a new data flow source is what I'm saying. Okay. I okay. think that you can borrow some of the code, but you're essentially writing a new data flow source, right? So I, I, I this, you right. So so the way you should think about this, I mean, you're writing a new source, right? So you're implementing the record method and the records method, and you can probably leave off the update method for now, right? Actually, in fact, I would just say raise not implemented error during in the record method and in the in the update method and then only implement the records method right now, right? Because that's the only thing that matters for your use case at this point, yeah. right? So um, so for a path forward here, um, so uh, clean up operation. So implement a new source, um, raise not implemented error in dot record and dot update um, implement dot records um, to be um, to run a data flow provided via the config um, uh, uh, you know have Okay, have or implement a new. So implement a new operation which outputs all of the records in a source. Um, uh, use this operation within your new new source. Um, uh, then then you should be able to index easily and stuff right so if you were and so then you need to figure out so you have all of your at this point you you would have loaded in all your stuff into a giant you know an array of array or an array of objects or an array of arrays right yes. um, once you implement that that operation um, and you're running that operation from this data flow which you're which you're running from your new source yes. and when so you need to figure out okay so when you're implementing the dot records method within your new source uh, when you get output uh, from the data flow um, being run uh, turn you know somehow uh, turn that output into records which you yield um right does that make sense uh, maybe we do not have to do indexing then because yeah. uh, 
we can save the uh, pre-processed data into the same records and we can like directly train from that. Uh, what? Uh, like, uh, we have this source, right? And we will uh, take all the data from the source. We will do pre-processing on it. Mm -hmm. And we will uh, save the uh, pre-processed data in the same source format. And, and then I'm thinking we don't have to do indexing or anything like that. We can just take the uh, data from the source and do the training on that. Um, you mean like you don't have to save it back to the intermediary CSV file? Yes, maybe we do not have to do that. Well, you don't have to do that either way, right? Like that's just, I think for the sake of a tutorial, it's nice to show the merge command, right? Because that basically, you know, then you can cat the output of the CSV file and you can show them that the data changed, right? And then you can show them that they train on it, right? The, the modified data, right? Yeah. So if you implement this data flow and this new source that uses a data flow, then um, you know you would run the merge command using this new source, right? Um, yeah. So not the existing data flow source, but this new data flow source, and save it, still save it to the intermediary uh, CSV file, right? Does this all sound good? Do you have any, like any any anything else we need to flush out here? Uh, I think uh, when I will start working on it, then we can discuss. Okay, because I think so. I think your output layer might be similar here. I think you're probably going to not have that input layer type of thing, right? That input layer becomes this operation that loads all the data from the source, right? And then the output layer is still okay. Now the output layer is okay. How do I select, um, you know, how do I turn these things into records now? Um, or like, you know, how do I return probably dictionaries that then, you know, in the source itself, I now interpret each dictionary in some kind of list that gets output as a, as a record, right? Which I then yield. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's have another meeting on, on Friday, um, just because I want to make sure that we're all, you know, we're all making progress here um, and, and nobody gets stuck. Um, you know, I want to make sure everybody can, can finish, um, you know, all the stuff that they set out to. So obviously, you know, we can do stuff after GSOC. Uh, that's always good. Um, but let's try to get this stuff done here uh, while we're at it. Um, okay. So, and please reach out to me and also please ping, um, you know, uh, Saksham and, and uh, Yash and, and Himanshu if you guys uh, need extra input, okay? Anything else that anybody wants to talk about today? Okay, great. Uh, no, thank you. Thanks, guys. Sorry we had to go so far over, but thanks for staying late. All right. Have a good one. Good luck with everything. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.